do a quick overview of the 12 stones of revival. Just make sure we're on the, the same page. All right. The first stone that we need to realize is that we need revival in our lives and in our community. Why? Because too many times we have a form of godliness but lacking the power therein found in 1 Timothy. We need revival. I hope that through this series, again, that you would see the need in our church, in our nation for revival. Man, just can't even get on social media or anything without seeing the divisions in our country, political. It's a ridiculous. Um, but we need God to bring healing. And it's in such terrible times in history where God has sought to shed his grace upon our country and this world by sending revivals with things seem the worst. Um, when things are looking bad, there's huge obstacles for the church. Looks like the church isn't going to make it and she's dwindling down to nothing. That's when God does his work. And you can say that for a nation, for a church, and for people individually as well. So the need for revival. Uh, what re revival is not, it's not hype, it's not manipulation, it's not evangelism only. The third stone would be, we need to understand what revival is. Revival is what? Relife, re-energizing, uh, stirring up of our spirits to set us on fire for God once again. So returning to our first love, and how do we do that? Or how does God work that in us? He does that by what? Uh, giving us the spirit of adoption, uh, making the truths of the Scripture become real to us. Everything that you studied in the, the Scripture, He makes it true to you in your spirit. He uh, gives you this, uh, this spirit of love. He pours out His spirit of love in your hearts. This is all from Scripture. I'm just quoting Scriptures to you that apply to this thing. First Peter, when God gives you an uh, inexplainable joy in your Christian walk, that's what I'm talking about. This is how he does it. He comes upon you. He fills you so full of his love. He's, he manifests his presence to you in a powerful way. And once you've received that and you've had this experience, um, everything I've read about it just changes everything. It changes churches. It changes uh, countries, millions of, are saved. Many young people get into the mission field. They're called to preach and to uh, do God's work. So that's what revival is. The greatest revival was Pentecost. For 400 years, God poured out His Spirit upon the church and the whole world as they knew it was uh, turned upside down, the Roman Empire. Uh, lessons from church history, we talked about all the great awakenings, the, uh, the Welsh revivals in Great Britain, the great awakenings in the U.S., millions upon millions saved. The fifth stone, uh, before we go to the fifth stone, you know what? You got to be a reader. I want you to be readers, man. Or book on tape, people. How about that? Find a a book that I have on my sheet of paper that I gave you. Read about revivals. Don't be lazy. Be a Christian who has passion for God. Read all about revivals. Get on the internet. Read about the Great Awakenings. Read about the great leaders of the Great Awakenings. Jonathan Edwards, D.L. Moody, uh, John Wesley, the Wesley brothers. You don't even know who those people are. You got to get reading church history. It's amazing. The fifth stone of revival that we looked at. Come on. Um, we have to recognize that God is sovereign in revival, right? We can pray for revival. We can seek God in revival. But just because we do that doesn't mean that revival is going to come always. Okay, you can pray for revival, but it doesn't mean it's going to come always. But you'll never get revival if you don't pray. So it's this balance here. 
Six, by praying for personal and corporate revival, by asking God for help. This is the main principle I see throughout history in God's moving in the New Testament and through revivals all throughout history was a praying people, a praying church, uh, a church where God, God's people become passionate about knowing God and making Him known. Where uh, you come to gather with a group of Christians every Sunday and it's not talking about, oh man, did you see the spurs? Yeah, cool, that's, whatever. No, the first thing your heart's desires to talk about these experiences you've had with the Holy Spirit this week. Did you have a, let me just get real, how many of you had a significant experience with the Holy Spirit this week in your life? I see that hand. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. We should all be running up in here. Man, y'all can't tell you what awesome, cool stuff God did in my life this week. That's what I'm talking about. That's church. And I want that for all of you. I want that for us. And it comes with a humbled heart. A person who is humble is a person who prays, who seeks God. So this revival will never come if we don't pray individually and corporately as a church. Seven, praying that God will prepare you for revival, right? Sometimes we're not even ready. I'm like, I'm so far into the world. I'm so far seeking my desires and what I want. I'm not even ready for God to do anything. So God, I'm not there yet, but get me there, right? And I share the story of the father whose son was uh, demon-possessed and thrown into the fire and almost killed. And he says, I don't have that faith, but what? Increase my faith. Increase my faith. Give us a hunger and a thirst. God, I'm not there yet. I'm not on fire. I feel cold. I feel distant from you, God. I'm not there, so help me get there. That's the prayer God hears, that humble prayer. I want to read a quote by D.L. Moody, who God used in Chicago. He was the greatest soul winner of his generation. He wrote, as I prepare to begin another round of revival meetings, I am reminded once again of the importance of preparation. First of all, my heart must be prepared if I am to effectively to be used of God as I preach during the course of the revival meeting. Secondly, the pastor's heart must be prepared as he leads the revival meeting endeavor. Then the hearts of the people must be prepared as well. All of this is imperative. The heart's must be prepared to receive what God wants for you. When you come to church on Sunday mornings, get up, get in the Word. Don't turn on the TV. Get on some worship music. Let God start softening your heart to receive the message and to come with other believers to worship Him. Praying that God would soften your heart for revival. That's a major stone. Number eight, by fasting for personal and corporate revival. Um, there's a story in Mark 9, 25 through 29. The disciples couldn't cast out a demon. They're like, walking the demon didn't come out? Jesus said, some only come out through fasting and prayer. There's something powerful that's connected to fasting and prayer. We see it in Scripture. It's in Scripture the apostles, the New Testament Christians did it. Throughout Christian history, during this time and movements of God, you can see they fasted once a week at least. Not just the pastors, not just D.L. Moody, not just Jonathan Edwards. Everyday Christians in their pews fasting and praying for God's outpouring of His Spirit, that God would use them. Number eight. Number nine, by fervent praying, not only praying, not only fasting and praying, but fervently praying to God. James 5.16 tells us, all right, when you get old, you should use bigger fonts. Oh, I could just do this. 
that do that, expand it. James 5, 16, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another. Yeah, confessing your sin one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Here it is. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. I'm not talking about mamsy pamsy prayers. Oh God, I hope that you can do something about my situation. Yeah, this casualness about prayer. Coming before God's throne casually? No, that's not what the scriptures teach us. That's not what's been shared and modeled for us throughout scripture and church history. Fervent, passionate prayers to God for lost people, for your own soul, for the movement of God in your church, in your life. It's God lighting you up. When I think about lost friends that I work with, lost family members, I'm not coming, uh, you know, me and Jesus, yeah, I'd like to see my boys get saved. No, I'm passionately calling out that God would convict them of sin, that God's spirit would fall down upon them, that God would draw them to salvation. You see the difference? There's a difference between going to a prayer meeting when, you know, everyone's there. There's no passion. The Holy Spirit's not lighting people up. I'm talking about throwing that out the window and calling and being desperate to God to do something in your life and in the life of the people that you love. Fervent, passionate prayers. I want to read something to you from a book that I've been reading on revival. It's called Lectures on Revival. It was written in the 1800s. The formula is simple and the blueprint clear. If my people which are called by name, my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Second Chronicles 7.14, you probably heard that verse a lot. Humility and brokenness before God. Fervent and sincere prayer. Seeking Him and beseeching Him. Turning from our sin in sinful ways and true repentance. And confessing and forsaking that which is an offense to a holy and righteous God. Bring those times of refreshing at hand of the Lord. These four prerequisites for revival. Humility, prayer, seeking His face, repentance. Are not the byproducts of revival. Do you underhear that? These are not the byproducts of revival, but must occur in the heart of the individual believer in need of revival, if revival is to recur at all. Prayer alone without obedience will never birth a spirit-born, spirit-sent revival. Prayer is essential, but without obedience, revival is hindered. D.L. Moody. There is a whole... Revival, 1857, 1858. It's called the Fulton Street Revival in New York City. It started as a prayer meeting. One man who was a businessman was hired for less than $1,000 a month to be an evangelist for this Dutch Reformed church. He was going out. His job was to knock on doors every day and preach the gospel. He was working hard for the Lord. But not much results. So he decided, I better start praying. And it might be good if all of us started praying as well. And so one guy, two guys, six guys, it just blows up. God just... The revival, 1857 and 1858, as a result of that revival, about 8% of the whole United States population became believers. That's pretty cool. That would be like 24 million people saved in the U.S. 
and two years. That's what I'm talking about. That's what we need. That's what we need. So it's fervent prayers. Then praying in the Holy Spirit is number 10. By praying in the Holy Spirit. Jude, uh, Jude 120, Jude 120 says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, and what? Praying in the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Holy Spirit. I define it, as I looked at Scripture, I define it, I believe it means simply that it's Holy Spirit-directed prayers. It's the Holy Spirit guiding you, leading you to who to pray for, what to pray for, how long to pray. It's asking the Holy Spirit to lead and guide your prayers. I want to, when you pray, you don't want to pray your will, do you? You want to pray God's will. You want to pray God's will for your life, His desires for your life. So you're sitting out and you're asking God, hey, from the beginning, I want you to lead us. I want you to guide me. When I start praying in the Holy Spirit, I'm asking God to lead me. What happens? He starts giving me pictures of people's faces I start praying for. I'm like, man, I haven't seen that guy in like 10 years. But he's in my, I feel like, okay, I'm praying for that guy. He brings a name to my mind. I start praying for that person. He brings a scripture to my mind. I start praying it for those people. So the Holy Spirit will lead you in your prayers. He will give you faces. He will give you names. He will give you Bible verses to pray for those people. So pray in the Holy Spirit. Be led by the Holy Spirit. Again, all of these, each stone could be a full message. I'm trying to give you a survey. I'm just trying to give you the 10,000 foot level. So that's a very important stone that we should be doing. Uh, uh, this act, this principle that we should be uh, led by in our desire to see revival brought. The 11th stone will be by knowing and avoiding hindrances to revivals. A lot of times, preachers steal stuff from other guys. It's no secret. I um, stole this from uh, Mr. Sprague, who again, from the Lectures and Revivals, 1832. He was a Presbyterian church of the U.S. who had experienced revival firsthand and took an orderly and scholarly journal and approach to what he saw. At the end of this book, he wrote letters to a bunch of pastors and asked them to describe what God was doing and what he did in revival in their churches. It's amazing. I'd say get a copy and read it. It's pretty awesome. So what he found out from talking to all these pastors, from experiencing revival in his life and in his church, he said there were at least seven hundred hindrances to revival in a person's life in the life of a church. I want to share those with you. The first one is ignorance and misapprehension about revival. If you don't, that's why I said, if you're a reader, if you read about revival, if you study the New Testament scriptures, you can see the pattern of God's work. If you're ignorant of that fact, you won't even be seeking it. So the first obstacle, the first hindrance is ignorance of revival, and then misapprehension about revival. And like I said, like three or four messages ago, sometimes when God does such a cool work in somebody's heart, they get overwhelmed with the Holy Spirit. They don't know how to respond. Remember that guy I told you about? The old boy got up and ran around the church because he was so filled. He didn't know what to do, man. God was on him. Sometimes there's misapprehension. You've never seen anything like that. If you've never been around that, that can freak people out. So they'll say, it's all bad. It's all wrong. We're not going to seek revival. We're not going to have anything to do with it if it's crazy like that. If you do that, you're going to miss out on God's blessings. There have always been phenomenon, spiritual... Um, I would say, I'm trying to use the right word, a type of emotional 
experiences that have been always, almost always connected to revival. So there's going to be something that goes on. But just because someone has a reaction to the Holy Spirit doing something cool in their life that's out of the ordinary is not going to keep me from seeking God in revival. And it shouldn't you either. I don't want to miss out on God's blessings because some things get a little crazy sometimes. I mean, think about going to a Spurs game. You get so excited, man. We're high-fiving each other. Yeah, yeah. Why not a church, man? Don't you get excited about the blood of Christ? Don't you get excited about the resurrection of Christ, the Holy Spirit, and God's work in your life? I'm ready to high-five some people now. Ignorance and misapprehension about revival would keep it from coming. Next, I'm going to do these quickly. A spirit of worldliness among Christians. If you're a church, if you're a Christian and you're so concerned about getting money, if you're so concerned about getting a position of power and seeking things of this world, this revival's not going to come. God doesn't want to play games. It's going to be him or nothing else. So worldliness among Christians is a hindrance to revival. The third thing, lovers of pleasure. Sprague said they tolerate and embrace any gross or perverse amusement, sexual sins, homosexuality, uh, pornography, I'm adding these, adultery, immorality, lust of food, endless, mindless entertainment. That's where we live today. Mindless entertainment. Hours upon hours on YouTube. Hours upon hours of playing games. Uh, you can watch movies on your phone. It's just like, if you're seeking mindless entertainment, it's going to be a hindrance to the Holy Spirit's work in your life. The pursuit of God should be the highest calling and your highest priority every day. Direct communion and experience with the Holy Spirit should be your highest calling every day. And if that's not the case, then you're stifling revival in your life. Let me tell you something else. If you're living in gross sin, if you're living a worldly life, guess what? You're dampening the work of the Holy Spirit within your church. Do you understand that? What you do matters. How you live when you're home by yourself matters. Because you're quenching the Holy Spirit, not only in your own life, but in the life of your church. Lovers of pleasure. Next, a lack of personal responsibility among professing Christians. Uh, that's a very nice way in the 1800s of saying lazy Christians. If you're lazy as a Christian, if you're not using your gifts and abilities to build up the church, if you're sitting back and watching everybody else do stuff, then revival's not going to come to your life. Yes, God is sovereign. Yes, God does his work, but we must obey. We must put into practice what God is calling us to do. And if you're not doing that, again, it's hindering the work of God in your life and in your church. Uh, the next thing, tolerating gross sins in the church. This is a serious hindrance to revival. I'm talking about turning a blind eye to sin in a church. I don't think this has ever happened at our church. I'm not saying it couldn't. Usually this is like someone powerful in the church, someone who gives like, you know, 10000 a month to the church. Well, he's given us a lot of money, but we're going to turn the eye on his sin. See, if you do that, you're stifling the Holy Spirit. It's hindering the work of revival. We should not tolerate gross sin in our lives. We should not tolerate it in the body of Christ. And we do it in a spirit of love. We confront in love. We help, we're here to help people. We're not here to bring judgment on people. That's not our job. Our job is to, um, if we find a brother and sister in sin, we lovingly help them overcome if they accept help. If not, we break fellowship. 
But if you tolerate sin, it's an offense to God. It's an offense to the head of the church, Jesus Christ, who calls this church to be holy and pure, right? Next, absence of, bro- <laughs> absence of brotherly love. Turn your Bibles to Galatians 6, 1 through 10. I'm going to read this quickly. Galatians 6, 1 through 10. Absence of brotherly love. Brothers, if a man is overtaken by any trespass, you who are spiritually who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something, then he is nothing. He deceives himself. But let each one of you examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For each one of you shall bear his own load. Verse 6. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Then skip down to verse 9. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Man, that's a church I want to go to right there. That's a great church. Did you read the love? Did you hear the, this, this heart that Paul has and his instructions to the church in Galatia? Brotherly love. The thing that will hinder revival in our church in your life is selfishness. Everything we just read was all about humility. It's all about Christ. It's all about putting others first instead of myself. I would add to this brotherly love forgiveness. Hey, we're all messed up here. We all need Jesus. We all still sin. But if I offend my brother or sister in Christ, or if I hurt them, I should be quick to ask for forgiveness. And that's how we live. That's how you live in your family, right? You're quick to forgive. You're quick to put your wife, your, your husband, your children's needs before you. Same thing in the household of faith. Christ is the head. He set this example of us for brotherly love. The absence of it will stifle revival. Unforgiveness will stifle revival. Be quick to forgive those who've offended you in the church. Be quick to um, be at peace with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Because we don't, we can have all the prayer meetings we want, but it's going to be limited because a lack of brotherly love, a lack of forgiveness throughout history in the church shows a stifling. You will stifle the Holy Spirit's work in your life and in your church, and we don't want that. All right, last thing. Churches that pick and choose what they teach they, they, have, uh, they leave out whole chunks of doctrine. They discount the miracles of Jesus. I'm talking about liberal churches. The liberal churches have never and will never have revival unless God revives them and causes them to repent of that. And I pray that for some of our uh, churches. I mean, once great churches like Meth- the Methodists, the Presbyterians, the Episcopalians, They've said, nope, we don't believe the Bible's true. I'm not saying all. I know some good guys and good sections of those denominations who've pulled apart. But for the most part, they've kicked out God in Scripture. And revival will never happen in those churches. The last part, 12, the last stone is really an an admonition. It's a restating of what we should be doing. 
We should really be doers of the word and not hearers only from the book of James. Sometimes as Christians in the U.S., we have so much information. I've read so many books on Christianity. I've read the Bible through multiple times. But it's not how much you know, it's how much you do that counts. We must be doers of the word. And I think if we are doers of the word in this church and individually, we're going to prepare ourselves to receive some blessings from God. The twelfth stone is fast, pray, preach, serve. These are the principles I've seen, I've read about. I think these are the biggest. If we practice these principles, I'm not saying we should copycat everything that was done before us. God doesn't work that way. We can't say, all right, this is how they had revival in Ireland in 1750. We're going to do the exact same thing as they did, and revival's going to come. No, it's not how it works. But the principles are there. Fast, pray, seek God, preach his word, and serve. Using your gifts and abilities. When God stirs you up, fast, pray, preach, serve. Put it into practice what we've Learn. So those are 12 stones of revival. I hope that God has given you a thirst to seek him and to seek revival in our church and individually. Over the next few months, and as we get through with summer and we get back to school, we're going to start our groups back up. We're going to have an emphasis on praying and seeking God. And again, again, doing the work, doing the work. Switch over, flip over to the backside of your sheet that Gay passed out. Do you guys get a sheet? Okay. I want to give you an assignment. This is your assignment for this week. And like Ethan Hunt from Mission Impossible, you don't have a choice. You got to do, <laughs> you got to do the assignment. Not really. You have a choice, but I would like for you to do this for me this week. I want you to fast and pray for revival this week. You're like, man, I've never gone four hours without eating. Look at me. It looks like I've missed any meals. Occasionally. But when it's something so important as revival and the salvation of people that are close to me, I can go without food. And God calls us to do it. You do it when you will. I'm going to do it. I'm going to skip dinner on Wednesday night. I'm going to skip breakfast and lunch. And then during those times, I'm going to be praying that God will do something cool in your life, that God will do something cool in our community, and he will do something cool in our church, right? And I want you to join me in that if you can. You're like, man, I don't know what to pray for. What am I going to do? I will go down. See there, Neil Cole's strategic prayer focus. Those are things that you can pray for your lost friends. Those are Bible scriptures that you can pray for lost people. The third thing I want you to do as you're praying, uh, number one, fast and pray for revival. Then specifically, number two, I want you to pray for the neighborhood. I want you to pray specifically for this apartment complex and this neighborhood over here. Because that's where we're going. We're going to search uh, number three. Why do you want to do that? Because number three, I want you to pray for a house of peace. Pray for a house of peace. Uh, this Saturday at 10 a.m. for about two hours, I'm going to go and I'm going to look for someone. I'm going to share the gospel with people in this apartment complex and that neighborhood. I felt that the elders wanted it done. They prayed about it. I'm going to do it. I feel called to it. I'm going to be the tip of the spear, but I need some hold, someone holding the spear. That's going to be done in prayer. Now, if you cray-cray like me, if you're a front lines, tip of the steer type of guy or gal, you can go with me. 
You don't have to do anything but pray and uh, keep records of who we talked to and what, what we did. And if you actually want to do it, I'll train you. It does, it's not that hard. All it takes is a little Holy Spirit boldness to get her done. I think God rewards obedience. You could go and have the worst gospel presentation ever been given. And if you're bold and the Holy Spirit's with you, people are going to get saved. That's just the way it works. It's not about how talented you are. It's about how available you are to God to use you. So it takes team. It takes a team effort. I'm going to be out there on the front lines. You can be my support staff praying, or you can get in the foxhole with me, whatever the Holy Spirit leads you to do. That's cool. You have my number, right? 210-255-7416. You want to go? Call me. We'll set up a time. Or meet here at 10 a.m. on Saturday. So, again, Neil Cole's strategic prayer focus. Lord, I pray that you draw, number one, Johnny to himself. I pray that no one comes to the Father unless the Holy Spirit draws him. We're praying Scripture for people, praying God's will for people in those 10 verses right there. Uh, lastly, there's a bunch of resources you could go to. Um, I would start 24 sermons by Martin Lloyd-Jones on revival are amazing. Again, that, if you can listen to those, do that. Lectures on revival, W.B. Sprague. You can get that from number five, Banner of Truth. Uh, books, lots of books there. Those are all the things I kind of read in preparation um, for the sermon series. All right, let's, we're done.